Welcome to this week's edition of Ask an MS Expert. I'm John Strum, and I'm the host of the Real Talk MS podcast. Each week, Real Talk MS reaches thousands of people in more than 100 countries around the world with news that people affected by MS need to know. My wife, Jean, lived with progressive MS for 23 years, so I've had a front row seat experiencing all the ways that MS can impact the family. Currently, I'm a member of the International Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Steering Committee. I'm a district activist leader and trustee for the National MS Society, and I chair the Society's California Government Relations Advisory Committee. Thank you and welcome to all of you who are joining us on GoToWebinar, Facebook Live, YouTube Live, and Twitch. The MS Society's Ask an MS Expert webcast is designed to give us a place for the MS community to connect and to connect you with MS experts who are ready to answer your questions on the topics that impact people affected by MS every day. Please feel free to post your comments and questions in the GoToWebinar chat box. MS navigators are online throughout today's program, answering questions and connecting you with resources. As we get underway today, I'd like to acknowledge and thank our premier national sponsor, EMD Serono. Support from MS community partners helps the National MS Society reach its goal of providing up-to-date information and support through programs like Ask an MS Expert. Summer can be the perfect season for travel. However, health issues, safety concerns, and limitations caused by the pandemic may mean more of us will be staying close to home this year. Today, we're talking about having fun close to home while staying safe and staying cool. We're joined by Dr. Colin Lennington, an occupational thera therapist and clinical specialist at the VA Long Beach Healthcare System within the Spinal Cord Injury and Disorder sy System of Care. Dr. Lennington provides clinical care for veterans with neurological conditions, including spinal cord injury, multiple sclerosis, and ALS in inpatient, outpatient, and acute rehabilitation settings, as well as in the wheelchair seating clinic and assistive technology lab. Dr. Lennington is also the program lead for the adaptive sports and home access and safety programs and Dr. Lennington serves as adjunct faculty at the University of Southern California Chan Division of Occupational Therapy and Occupational Service. Welcome and thank you for joining us today, Dr. Lennington. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, John. If you're staying close to home this summer, it's important to keep active and discover those places to go and things to do that are fun and local. Depending on where you live, that can include visiting a national park, which is an ideal venue for enjoying nature and exploring natural landscapes. Dr. Lennington, do national parks accommodate people with mobility challenges and do they offer accessible trails? That's an excellent question, John. And I, you know, I always want to have like a blanket statement, I feel like, to say yes, they can be accessible, but also we know um, with diagnoses like multiple sclerosis, people living with multiple sclerosis, um, everyone's functional ability is very different. Um, it could be even very different day to day, obviously. And so while um, the National Park Service does do, I think, a pretty good job of providing access, um, you know, whether it's truly accessible for you specifically is going to vary uh, depending on your um, presentation even that day. And so I that's going to be a consistent theme throughout our conversation today, and I'll probably reference it a few more times, but I just want to make sure um, to have that kind of qualifying statement out there. But, um, you know, before we super dive into that exact question, you know, we know as OTs um, that what you do in your everyday life uh, really impacts how you feel, right? And so for those people that want to go to their national parks, that want to be active, uh, all the things we're going to discuss today, I just kind of want to uh, commend everyone for for still putting the for putting the effort out there. Uh, it could really be worth your while. So, in terms of your specific question, um, yes, again, the National Park Service can be accessible. 
Uh, they've done actually a lot in the last five to six years to try to make their trails accessible um, with their all-in initiative. And their all-in initiative prioritizes accessibility throughout the park system. Um, trying to make it something that's not additional, not extra, that's something that is at a baseline level, something that I would consider more universal or incorporating universal designs to use um, accessibility language. Um, and you know, you can't make all parts of the wilderness accessible, right? Uh, there's gonna be areas that are difficult to get to that maybe are just not reasonable to expect um, certain people to be able to do, particularly safely. Uh, we always wanna prioritize safety for everyone that's going out and participating, especially outdoors. Uh, but there are a lot of things that they have done and they can do um, to make the baseline trailheads or to make overlook experiences uh, more accessible, such as putting down tarmac, making sure trails are more graded, um, putting down decomposed granite or DG, uh, pounding out flat areas so they can be more wheelchair accessible or to reduce the amount of trip hazards uh, for people that are ambulating. And so, yes, I do think they've done a fairly decent job. Uh, the other thing, though, I would caution is, of course, all trails are different. All national parks are different, uh, which is part of the beauty of our national parks. You know, they can be so varied and so different. And so making sure that wherever you're planning to go um, is accessible for you is going to be the priority. And we'll talk about that also. Um, I would highly recommend people who are planning to go to national parks go to the National Park Service website uh, and check out the individual trails that they're planning to go to. They actually have an accessibility tab um, where you can learn more information about what's um, going to be accessible or what they've done to make it accessible and really compare that to what you feel like you need um, or maybe what you need just that day or what you're expecting to need that day because it can be very different. And so I think that's something that's just, again, really important to consider. Uh, there are also um, things that you can do to rent or to bring uh, adaptive equipment that can help you access trails or other national parks, uh, whether that's a wheelchair or um, for us in adaptive sports, there's even like tank-based wheelchairs uh, that have the tracks that are pretty cool that people might have uh, seen. And sometimes those are available to rent, sometimes those are available free of charge, depending on where you are. Uh, but again, just make sure you you call ahead, you look at the websites ahead of time and, and really plan, plan, plan. That's kind of one of the really big um, themes, I think, of today for us when we're discussing all of these things to be safe. Uh, I know that's nothing new for people that are living with MS. Um, planning and preparation is, is I understand, always going to be vital for to living your lives as best you can and uh, having the highest quality of life. Can you tell us what the National Parks Access Pass is? Sure. So the Access Pass um, provides U.S. citizens um, with permanent um, disabilities uh, free access actually to all of the national parks. And so it's a really neat system. Uh, you don't have to pay to, to access. You do still have to make reservations sometimes. Uh, and you do still need to make sure that it's obviously during an open season um, and it's going to be safe and accessible for you. Uh, but it's a really neat program um, to, to be able to save um, save some hard-earned dollars and uh, be able to access the national parks. Sounds great. If we can switch gears from traveling from home to staying at home, we've heard from Kim, who loves to garden, but she says she finds it calming and relaxing until MS-related fatigue sets in, and then Kim says gardening becomes exhausting. Well, can you share some of the benefits of gardening and how it can be adapted for people with MS? Sure, sure. Well, any physical activity uh, provides a lot of benefits, and we can talk about this a little bit later as well. But gardening in particular um, has been shown in research to be calming and relaxing. Um, it has meditative qualities. Uh, it also incorporates, you know, physical components that are good for um, managing comorbidities, uh, maintaining aerobic exercise, depending on how you're doing it. Um, and so there's a lot that goes into it that's really beneficial, uh, not just physiologically, but, but mentally as well. As far as adaptations, um, as an occupational therapist, we focus a lot on um, energy conservation principles 
which are principles that um, allow you to do what you want to do, when you want to do it, how you want to do it, but in a way that's going to maximize kind of your potential. Um, and so this is something that we think about in terms of choosing when do you want to garden, how do you want to garden. Um, as far as, you know, think about the time of day when you garden earlier versus later, uh, avoiding those really hot parts of the day. As far as, you know, thinking about gardening particularly, um, you know, a really common one is if people have weaker grasps or grip in their hands. Uh, something that could be very helpful is doing a built-up handle. Uh, you could do something as simple as getting some newspaper and taping around the handle uh, to make it wider. Uh, or you can get like the, the foam um, pool noodles and cut that off and slide it over something. That can be really helpful. Uh, additionally, Raised beds are very nice. Um, for a lot of people, it's difficult to get down you know, to the ground on your hands and knees um, safely. And so having something at a higher level or pots can also do that, achieve that. Um, you know, incorporating rest breaks, uh, spacing out the activity, doing more of those energy conservation principles are things I think will ultimately help someone participate, but also then not become exhausted to the point that then they can't do other things they want to do. Staying home means you may have more time to find a new hobby or try an activity you haven't tried before. What are some leisure activities people can explore from home and how can they easily get started? Oh man, that's a great question, but I feel like kind of the world is your oyster. Whatever, whatever you want to do, whatever your interests are, there's a way to do it. Um, and for me, you know, when I work with the veterans here, um, a lot of times people kind of uh, pre-diagnosis had interest in art or painting or perhaps they um, they did pottery things of that nature and so i try to kind of re-engage people's interests or to teach them new things um, that can be done obviously inside um, so things that i already mentioned drawing painting uh, jewelry is a good one uh, different hobbies such as learning new languages or um, building models of different things, um, going to different, you know, different websites and providing information, um, just engaging with the community, I think is really important also, um, and your personal experiences in some of these things. Uh, and there's a lot of ways to do that. There's, there's community centers, depending on your age, there's also senior centers. Um, you can go to local art uh, art shops. Uh, obviously, right now, uh, with the way the world has been the last you know year and a half, um, it's going to be a little different than how it would have been before COVID. Uh, but you know, just do what you feel comfortable doing as far as going out into the community. But there's definitely ways to bring things in. You can rent pottery equipment. You can rent other items. Um, just look and see what's what's near you as far as classes or online programs that you can also participate in. There are days during the summer when it's just too hot to go outside. What are some activities that people can think about doing when the temperature heats up? I mean, again, I feel like it's based off your interests. Uh, you can really do what you want to do, but a lot of times, a lot of times, I, I recommend people kind of become tourists in their own city. Um, I think a lot of time we take for granted where we live and what's near us. So um, thinking about places that have air conditioning or places that have lots of shade, uh, places like museums or science centers, the library has a lot of great programs, um, going to movie theaters, you know, anything that you can kind of manage uh, your temperature and also kind of have expectations of what you're going to get um, in terms of making yourself uh, safe. You know, there was a time where if you wanted to visit a winery, you'd have to plan a trip to a specific region of the country or the world. But today it seems like you can find wineries and craft breweries almost everywhere. Some have live music and offer food, which really makes going wine tasting or craft beer sampling a fun afternoon or day trip. How can someone find out about these venues and learn which ones are accessible? Yeah, uh, wine tasting, beer tasting, I think, uh, as you mentioned, has really kind of gripped uh, gripped the world. And so there's a lot more opportunities to do so no matter where you are. Uh, I always recommend, I feel like I'm going to say this a hundred times, but 
plan, 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 call ahead, look at the websites ahead. Uh, for, for people that are maybe new to a specific area, I recommend using Google Maps or some other search device where you can actually physically see the outside area where you're going, um, ideally. Uh, hopefully the website of the winery or the brewery has pictures also, so you can kind of get a better sense of if it's gonna be really accessible for you. Obviously, you can see if it's ADA accessible. Just a word about the ADA. Uh, I always caution people that the ADA basically means a minimum guideline. It's a minimum accessibility guideline, not a maximum, not a gold standard. And so the ADA doesn't necessarily mean accessible for all. So you know, again, think about your particular circumstances, how you're gonna functionally move in a space, what you need to be safe um, or your support system, and then really kind of compare and contrast what's available on the website, what's available at the Tourism Bureau. There's a lot of great information. Um, and really think about, again, applying it to you personally, what's going to be the best option for you to be able to participate. Before we continue our discussion, I'd like to take a moment to welcome those of you who have continued to join us. Please let us know what's on your mind. Type your questions into the question or chat box on GoToWebinar. MS Navigators are online throughout today's program, answering your questions and connecting you to resources. Our Ask an MS Expert program takes place at this same time every Friday. So please help us make sure that everyone knows about it by sharing news about the webcast with your family and friends. Exercise and physical activity are essential to general health and well being, and we know they provide real benefits to people living with MS. Mild weather makes summer a great time to commit to exercise or explore new sports and activities many of which are now accessible through adaptations or modifications. So Dr. Lennington, what are the benefits of exercise and physical activity for people living with MS? And how do those things affect someone's overall quality of life? That's an excellent question. And so again, I, I, I said this a little earlier, but as an occupational therapist, we know what we do and how we do impacts our daily lives and impacts our health. Right. And so what we choose to engage in, what we choose to do, and it's not just exercise. And I love that this question also asks about physical activity, because you don't need to be out there running a marathon or playing a professional sport or in the Paralympics uh, to be active. You can participate in things in your daily routines that can provide, you know, an enormous amount of benefit to you in a number of ways. And so I, I really like that it includes that physical activity as part of your you know, larger health scope. And so, you know, as far as the benefits, um, flexibility, balance, strength, uh, cardiovascular fitness, pulmonary fitness, uh, research has shown uh, exercise, physical activity can help uh, cognition, bowel bladder function. Uh, and for me also, you know, maintaining that socialization, uh, family activities, family roles as an occupational therapist are really important. And so being able to engage in those things all together in a package, again, improve quality of life. And so that's something that's really important to, to note. You know, for people specifically living with MS, uh, it helps manage those comorbidities, particularly those vascular ones that can affect disease progression, uh, high blood pressure being the one that comes to mind most frequently. Um, you know, and so again, thinking about physical activity versus exercise, exercise can be more structured. It can also be a little scary, I think, for some people to think about like, oh, exercise, I have to exercise, I have to do this one thing. But just being active, just moving around your house, uh, whether you're, again, gardening that we talked about earlier or doing the laundry or doing dishes, uh, you know, helping around the house, doing walking the dog, you know, these can all be things that provide a benefit to you as far as your health and your quality of life. And I do want to give a shout out to the National MS Society that recently published, um, you know, their MS guidelines for, for activity that uh, when I first learned about participating on this talk today, I went and looked at, you know, perused around the website and I was very impressed by the guidelines that are posted for, for all people with MS, depending on their disease progression and what they feel safe and capable of doing. So if people have not checked that out, I would definitely recommend they go check it out because it's a great tool to use to kind of gauge what you're going to be able to do and be safe for yourself. You know, as you were listing 
all of those benefits that people with MS can derive from exercise, physical activity. I couldn't help but think if someone came up with a pill that would deliver all of those benefits, the people lining up for that pill, well, that line would be really long and that pill might be really expensive as we've come to know about other MS medications. What's so amazing here is you get all those benefits without having to take a pill, without having to spend a whole bunch of money. Uh, so to me, I, th this, is, this is a solution that I think everyone should take to heart. Thank you for, for really expanding on that. Of course. No, yeah, I agree 100%. It seems like a no-brainer, right? If you told someone, what if I could give you all these things, they would do it, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, you can. It's in your power to do it. So 100% agree. So you mentioned a moment ago the uh, society's guidelines talk about the fact that everyone at every ability level can find a way to participate in, in physical activity. Can you tell us a little bit about adaptive sports and recreational activities? Of course. And, and you know, for me, this is a passion area as a program lead for adaptive sports here. And so let me just start, you know, adaptive sports and or activities, you know, at a baseline are basically things that people with disabilities participate in. Um, and that disability could be physiological, cognitive, sensory. There's a lot of things um, that will qualify someone to do and participate in those things. Um, it's basically, you know, any athletic event or activity that you can think of um, now. And it's just adapted. It's just modified to meet the needs of the person who wants to participate. And so whether that's modifying with um, adaptive equipment or modifying the rules a little bit to make certain allowances to allow more people to participate, that's kind of the, the baseline of what adaptive sports and recreational activities are. Um, you know, I will say in terms of different sports and activities, they try to maintain kind of the originality and the core of the sport as much as possible. So, you know, there's some recognition of what that sport is. But on the other hand, there's actually sports that exist that don't exist outside of adaptive sports. Um, goalball being an example, that's purely a sport that uh, people with disabilities created and play. Uh, over the line is a game that technically someone without a disability could play, but it's really created by the disability community um, to play baseball, basically. And so there's a lot of different things people can do to participate, um, you know, by modifying the rules or by, by adaptive equipment, you know, and people think, I think sometimes of, of adaptive sports or adaptive equipment and they can be overwhelming or I don't want to be someone that, that needs to use something. I think sometimes there's a stigma behind uh, getting help through equipment or getting help through change of rules. But, you know, for example, uh, I went, I went bowling with my cousin, not that long ago, and you know he uses bumpers uh, when he bowls because he's you know five years old, and that's an example of adaptive equipment. That's a modification. That's not something that you know in the professional bowling league they would use, uh, but it allows him to participate and it allows him to have a lot of fun. So it doesn't need to be something overtly um, you know different. Uh, on the same hand, I've also had veterans that have virtually no. Uh, you know, functional movement below their neck that have driven um, a power snow ski with their mouth, with a mouse stick. So, you know, it's everything in between. And so, you know, anything you can think of, um, we've probably tried it or have done something to let someone participate. Uh, for people that have mobility challenges frequently, uh, you could modify the sport to uh, be wheelchair accessible. Just a lot of wheelchair accessible sports whether that's basketball, rugby, baseball, um, there's golfing, there's, there's golfing adaptations that allow people to actually help people come to a standing position to still swing a golf, golf club. Uh, there's just really endless possibilities. And so, you know, a quick plug again, we already talked about like the benefits of general exercise and general activity, but you know, the benefits of adaptive sports, research has shown, helps physiologically, helps psychosocially, helps your functioning in your everyday activities, uh, and has been shown to prove quality of life. Uh, so I, again, there's really kind of no reason not to do it. You know, if you have an interest in adaptive sports, or if you had interest in sports and you 
want to go back to it or you want to try something new, uh, there's something out there for you, whether it's seated, standing, you know, a lot of movement, a little bit of movement, uh, small, small groups, team, individual, all the different types of sports that are out there in the world. That's the different types of adaptive sports that are out there in the world. We've heard from Brian, who says he's interested in learning a new sport, but he's not sure what he'll be able to do physically. How does someone know what kind of activity or sport is right for them? That's a great question. And, you know, again, I start with kind of what your interests are, because what your interests are is going to help you lean towards what you're going to want to do and what you're going to try to do. Um, you know, obviously, uh, knowing your body and being safe is, is critical. We don't want anyone to do something that's going to hurt themselves. You need to have a baseline. You need to understand what's going to be safe for you. And that's where working with a team or working with a community partner or a rehabilitation specialist such as myself or other occupational therapists, physical therapists, um, MS specialists are going to be really critical to doing um, kind of an inventory or an evaluation of what you're physically capable of doing. Uh, it's great, obviously, to have those rehabilitation specialists on your team, but it's also something you can kind of do as a self-check. You know, if you, you know, we have, we're in the age of the internet, you have YouTube. If you're interested in a sport, go watch it and think to yourself, hmm, is this something that I think I could do and be safe doing it? Um, you know, but again, leaning on those specialists, uh, I think is going to be really critical, particularly for people that maybe are further along the disease progression, um, just to make sure you maintain kind of that baseline safety. I think you've mentioned a couple of these already, but what are some of the popular outdoor adaptive sports and activities for the warm weather months? Sure. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. Um, obviously, anything that involves a pool or involves the water is very popular. Swimming, kayaking, uh, scuba, snorkeling. Uh, there's a lot of sailing. Uh, there's, you know, an unlimited amount of things you can do in the water. Archery is one that a lot of people really enjoy. Bocce is another one. Man, bocce, if people don't know what bocce is, I highly recommend people to, to YouTube or look it up after watching this. Um, it's, it's another one where virtually anyone can participate. Uh, surfing, I mentioned golfing. You know, there's, there's so many out there that you can do in the summer months, uh, no matter where you are, um, that are really fun. And again, there's just, there's an unlimited amount of modifications and changes we can do to make it accessible for someone. So, you know, really the sky's the limit. So the flip side of that coin is if you're living with MS, being outside in the heat might cause problems. Are there adaptive sports and activities that take place indoors, preferably in air-conditioned facilities? Yeah, yeah uh, please. If it's indoors and it's during the summer months, it, it, I, I hope it's air-conditioned for your sake, especially if you're going to be moving around and being active. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, you know, wheelchair basketball, wheelchair rugby, over the line, bowling, bocce, these are all things that can be done on court sports inside or have indoor courts accessibility options. Uh, those are the ones I think are most common and can be used, <clears throat> excuse me, as, as a part of a team. And so those are the ones I think I probably recommend the most. Uh, one of our viewers, Anita, says she knows nothing about adaptive sports, but she thinks a group activity would not only be fun, but also be a great way to meet new people. How can Anita find an adaptive group, sport, or activity to take part in, and what strategies might you have for someone who wants to try a new sport or activity, or maybe just expand their fitness goals? How do you start? Sure, and that's a great question. I wish there was a single answer that would work for everyone. Uh, again, it's so individual and so specialized to what you want to do and what your uh, particular interests are, but as far as getting started, I. I highly recommend people, you know, you're already here, you're already part of the MS Society, uh, you know, you're already engaging with the community. I would highly recommend you continue to do that. Ask your, your peers, ask your mentors what they've done and where they participated, especially if it's finding something local to you, whether it's a local club or a local team. Um, if you don't have someone like that to reach out to, there are some other places you can look. There's a teamusa.org, which is the Olympic and Paralympic website. There's a 
uh, Adaptive Sports Club Finder tool, and you literally punch in your your zip code. It pulls up the list of all the different uh, Adaptive Sports Clubs that are in the area, and you know these these people are completely inclusive. They want to bring in new people. They want to teach people the ropes. Uh, and people, I think, sometimes are a little also intimidated by the fact that it's an Olympic or Paralympic sports club. Um, don't be. It's it's a it's a it's how they get new members. You know, the all the Paralympians that are participating, you know, basically now, right, uh, started somewhere, right. And so that could be you. Um, start somewhere. Start start slow, uh, and just kind of ease into it. I guess is also kind of leaning into the second part of that question in terms of how do you start. Uh, you know, setting goals, I think, can be helpful as long as they're what we call, you know, smart goals. So they need to be specific, measurable, um, achievable, and realistic, I think are probably the two biggest ones. Um, don't set goals that you're going to be a Paralympian, you know, next year, uh, if you're just starting out a sport. Uh, timely is really important. Uh, I should also mention, if you circling back, trying to find more, more adaptive sports clubs, uh, the VA gives out um, millions of dollars every year to adaptive sports programs. So if you look at the, if you go to the, if you search uh, VA adaptive sports and you go to the adaptive sports grant recipients list, you'll see, uh, you know, a whole bunch of programs that received millions of dollars sometimes from the VA to, to help their adaptive sports programs. And you don't need to be a veteran necessarily to participate. These are outside community organizations that do adaptive sports or rec. Uh, that are also just getting some some funding from the government, as well as uh, Move United Sport is another thing you could Google. Uh, it's an entire adaptive sports community. Again, they list local clubs, list activities, and how to do things. Um, but again, I think you know, starting local, starting with your group of people that you're already interacting with, whether that's a mentor or a friend, um, is kind of the easiest way. You know, find have a buddy. Have someone go do something with someone, uh, try something out, and that's, I think, what helps people um, feel the most comfortable in trying something new. Swimming is a very popular summer activity. It's it's great exercise for everyone, and I'm hoping you can tell us about the benefits of swimming for people living with MS. Yeah, swimming is great for so many reasons. Uh, one, you're in the water, right? So as far as heat, that helps a lot. Um, you do have to be mindful of the heat. You don't want it too warm or too cold. Somewhere around 84 degrees seems to be, you know, across across the research what people recommend as far as the pool. Um, the biggest one is that swimming is really low impact, right? So you're in the water. It reduces the impact of gravity. Uh, it makes you feel lighter. It makes movement easier. And so you can do things in the water that you just sometimes can't do on land. And so uh, Taking advantage of that to be physically active um, is, is just a great benefit of being in the water. Uh, additionally, the, the viscosity or the amount of resistance that the water creates kind of acts like um, weight, you know, as if you're in the weight room or if you're using resistant bands. So again, moving against the water actually creates kind of that um, resistance that can help really build muscles and uh, can help relieve stress on on your joints um, while moving. So, you know, and for me personally, just the water I find just very rejuvenating uh, and also very relaxing. And so, although you might not be relaxing while you're in the water if you're exercising, um, it's just a really, um, you know, personal experience that I think a lot of people just find a lot of pleasure from being in the water. And so, I think that's just something that's really great too. So where can someone swim if they don't happen to have a pool in the backyard? Yeah, yeah, man, I wish I had a pool in my yard. But, um, you know, there's a lot of options. Obviously, community organizations, uh, places like the YMCA. Uh, another place that I think a lot of people don't think about is local universities. Most universities have pools, and especially if they're um, public universities, they usually have public swimming hours so look at look at those uh, other community pools you know maybe you have a friend that has a pool um, you know just do a little bit do a little bit of research there's usually something nearby um, but again the big one would be kind of making sure the temperature is kind of in that sweet spot around 84 degrees um, if there's a way to find out ahead of time that'd be critical 
or sometimes some pools actually have like kind of warmer and cooler seasons or times of the week, uh, depending on where they are. So just, you know, ask questions, just gather information. We've heard from Lucas, who said his physical therapist recommended something called hippotherapy to help improve his balance. Can you tell us what hippotherapy is and how it benefits people with MS? Sure. So hippotherapy actually involves horses. Uh, sometimes that's confusing to people. Uh, and so hippotherapy basically is a therapeutic riding program where people are on, on a horse. Um, and what's, what's really great about it is that the horse passively moves people's hips uh, and their pelvis, uh, mimicking the way that someone walks. And so by doing this, it can help improve balance, improve strength, improve uh, flexibility. It taps into your vestibular system. So the system that helps you know, like if you're upright and if you're moving and how you're moving. Um, and so again, the, the horse creates that movement, but you know, your, your body, your postural muscles have to adapt and move to, to move in the same way. And so it can really help activate those muscles in a way that you might not be able to otherwise. Nora wrote in saying she had a regular exercise routine until she experienced an exacerbation. Now she hasn't been able to exercise for several weeks. She's feeling frustrated. So how does someone know when it's okay to return to exercising? And are there any guidelines to follow so they don't try doing too much too quickly? That's a great question. And thank you, Nora, for writing that in. You know, it's it's so hard because you want to be active and you want to participate, but particularly people who are living with MS, um, exacerbations are a very real component, right, of, of that. And so the first thing I would say, you know, of course, if it's a severe exacerbation or if it's something that has been maybe a, a steady decline of how you're feeling, um, please make sure you consult your your medical team and your neurologist and you know uh, make sure there's nothing larger going on uh, there doesn't need to be some sort of change um, with your entire you know kind of care team program um, you know as far as an occupational therapist is concerned for me you know safety is always a priority and so making sure that you know for me i would recommend that the exacerbation is pretty much gone away and you're back to kind of your baseline before you restart things um, at least before you restart things kind of vigorously um, you know it's hard because it's so it's so specific for the person what are your exacerbations what are your symptoms where were you at baseline what type of activity were you doing and how rigorous was it um, you know i i think taking small steps, uh, again, like I said, uh, reaching out to your inter interdisciplinary team, your rehabilitation specialist, your OT, your PT, uh, and really con consider your individual risk. Um, I, I think, you know, just do a little bit at a time, see how you feel, uh, wait a little bit. You know, there's a thing called the rate of perceived exertion, um, which people with multiple sclerosis, you might already be familiar with. It's this way of, monitoring kind of your um, your heart rate, your blood pressure, uh, just to see how you feel and your rate on a scale from zero to 10. You know, you wanna keep that perceived rate very low when you're first restarting, uh, gradually increase. Um, some of the, the people I work with find it very helpful. You know, uh, this is a plug for all smart technology, but smart watches or anything that monitors your heart rate or your blood pressure, can be very helpful so you can kind of keep track of where you are um, in kind of your optimal range, uh, not too high, not too low. And so those are the things that really just make sure you're really listening to your body. You're not pushing yourself too hard, too fast. Uh, you wanna, you know, if you feel really crummy after you exercise or after you um, are active, you probably did too much. And so start, you know, start slow. Uh, I'll give yourself a couple minutes, see how you feel, go a little longer, see how you feel. If you still feel crummy a few hours later or the next day later, that's probably need to pull back a little bit. Many people with MS experience a temporary worsening of their symptoms when the weather is very hot or humid. These temporary changes can result from even a slight elevation in core body temperature, as little as a quarter to a half of a degree. Typical summer activities like 
sunbathing, hiking, biking, and just being outside may have that same effect, which is why it's important to plan ahead and have strategies for easing the effects of heat. Dr. Lennington, first, why does heat exacerbate MS symptoms? That's an excellent question, and as you noted, you know, a really small uh, amount of increase in core body temp, as you as you noted, research suggests a quarter to a half degree. So that's that's not very much, right? Uh, and so, you know, to just review a little bit, you know, how, you know, the the, the etiology a little bit of MS, you know, the the myelin sheaths uh, become demyelinate, demyelinate, demyelinated, excuse me. And so the the nerve impulse uh, down the neuron, down the axon gets slowed. And so with heat, that basically just slows that nerve impulse even more. And so that is kind of what triggers um, some of those exacerbations. Again, uh, I would recommend talking to, to your neurologist if you want more detailed. But as far as my perspective, that's kind of the, the etiology of what's going on. Um, and, you know, as far as how to how to manage that, we can talk a little bit about that. Uh, I, I want to talk about that in just a moment. I guess first I was hoping you might be able to tell us a little bit about what types of changes might people mm. experience when they're in heat for a period of time. Sure, sure, of course. You know, it, it's very different um, for everyone. I think there's this kind of pseudo exacerbation um, that happens where you can have that temporary, um, you know, just not feeling well. And so that could be fatigue, weakness, it could have, you could have spasticity, uh, blurred vision, vertigo, uh, feel dehydrated. You know, a lot of the things that you might feel, again, when you're having an exacerbation, might you might feel um, when you're being just kind of overheated. And how long do these kinds of changes last? So typically they don't last too long. You know, once you um, get out of the heat and you cool down, um, they should resolve relatively quickly. Um, it kind of depends on how extreme, you know, how overheated you got, how long it takes you to kind of get back to baseline. But, um, you know, drinking water, being in the, out of the heat, uh, being in an air conditioned place, being in a shaded place, using your cool packs and your ice packs, which we can talk more about if you would like. Uh, doing all those things, you know, taking off clothing if it's super um, saturated with with water because you actually makes it harder for your for your skin to um, evaporate that moisture and cool yourself off. You know, things that you can do to help bring your core temp back back down. And once your core temp gets back down, you should start feeling better. Uh, if not, then that would be kind of an indication to you that maybe you need to seek more medical attention. Well, air conditioning is certainly a very effective way of making summer heat a lot more tolerable, but it's also very expensive, especially during the summer months when electricity and natural gas rates tend to rise because everyone is running their air conditioning. But if someone doesn't have air conditioning in their home, what are some of the things they can do to stay cool? Sure, and that's a great point. Um, we can't necessarily be running our air conditioning all day, every day. Also, I know energy grid wise, you might have a blackout. Like, what do you do even if you have air conditioning, but it, it fails on you? And so uh, I mentioned earlier uh, cooling vests, uh, which are basically something you would wear over you. I'm sure most people watching are very familiar with them. Uh, they have like gel in gel pack inserts uh, that you can put and change out. Uh, drinking colder fluids, making sure you're wearing appropriate clothing that's not too uh, not going to be too heat producive. Um, misters are very helpful. Fans are very helpful. Uh, you know, just making sure you're you're really tracking also and planning ahead. Where are you going? Uh, what are you going to be doing? You know, again, kind of think about those energy conservation principles as far as planning um, your activity when it's going to be cooler or when you know it's not going to be necessarily um, put you at the highest risk. And then just be flexible with your schedule. Think about your body. Um, you know, crack a window if it's helpful, depending on how, how hot it is outside and if there's a breeze. You know, things that I'm sure everyone here can think of. But um, sometimes just having that extra reminder that there are other things you can do. 
Well, I'm glad you mentioned cooling vests um, because we actually received a question about them. So, so thanks for bringing it up. Uh, since you have, I'm wondering where can someone find cooling products? Yeah, so cooling vests actually, you know, um, honestly, I think places like Amazon or online marketplaces are great for finding places, finding things like that. Um, you can certainly go to a place like a rehab mart or another sort of medical supply store or medical supply um, online store, but sometimes those actually can be more cost prohibitive than just looking on something like Amazon. Um, again, I would make sure that you kind of look at the sizing of things when you purchase them, make sure they're gonna fit you and look at the size chart, uh, look at the, uh, the restrictions as far as where you can actually put them, what's recommended, and then where it's going to fit on your body. Robert wrote in saying that he relies on a lot of cold drinks to keep him cool in the summer. Can cold drinks really help? And if they can, what's the best thing to be drinking? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. It seems really simple, but yes, cold drinks can help. Um, if people have had that sensation, if you, you drink or you eat something really hot or really cold, you can feel it, right? It does actually go internally into your system and it can help. Um, this is going to sound really boring, but water is usually the best thing uh, for your body. Um, you know, if that sounds just too boring for someone or you need to, to kind of change it up, uh, you can have water infused with fruit or you can have some sort of carbonated water. Uh, there's a lot of different options actually right now on the marketplace as far as carbonated water uh, to make it a little bit more palatable or exciting for you. Um, avoiding drinks that have sugar is, is better. Uh, sugar can really spike your, your glucose, which might not help you as far as how you're feeling. Um, and so again, yeah, I know it's kind of a boring answer, but water is probably gonna be the best uh, for you, the, the cool water. We were talking about exercise and uh, adapt, adaptive sports and physical activities earlier. And we heard from Molly who says she's new to this, but she's worried that when she exercises, she'll get overheated. What are some ways for Molly to exercise while avoiding getting overheated? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, obviously, uh, if you can be indoors and you can be in the air conditioning, that's a great option. Um, if that's not an option or if that's not doing it for you, uh, I could recommend a lot of things pre-cooling. Sometimes people don't think about cooling down before they start exercising, um, whether that's drinking cool water or wearing uh, their vest before, their cooling vest before they start exercising can help. That way your body just has a, a larger range kind of of temperature that they can go through. Uh, exercising in a pool, again, using fans or um, misters, are all things that can really help. Again, also kind of doing a, a self check with yourself, you know, do a few minutes of exercise, take a break, how am I feeling? Um, trying to really be cognizant of how your body is doing and reacting to your activity. Well, I know that staying cool is really important to people who are living with MS and still want to benefit from getting out during the summer months and being active. Do you have any additional tips to help manage the heat that we haven't talked about yet? That's a great question. I, we've covered a lot of really, I think, topics that can be helpful. Um, the biggest one, I guess I would say, is if you can simulate training or doing something indoors that you would typically do outdoors. For example, adaptive cycling is a really big sport. I don't know if we talked about it earlier, if I mentioned it. Um, it's one that's really accessible for a lot of people, whether you use a tricycle that has three wheels for improved balance, or you do a regular stand-up two-wheeler. Um, you know, there's those same trainers that you use to make your cycle like a stationary st cycle that you use inside, you can use with adapted cycles. So if you want to do exercise, but you don't want to be outside, bring those inside. Uh, similarly, for other sports, you know, you can do resistance training, or you can do stretching, you can do components of those sports um, or you can do certain types of technique training uh, inside that maybe you wouldn't think to do inside, but think about kind of how you can maximize your, your air conditioning and your cooling uh, environment to, to continue to participate, I guess that's what I'd say. Well, you've shared a lot of great information today. What would you say are the top three takeaways that you'd like our audience to remember? 
top three takeaways. Okay, so number one, you know, after you've, well, I guess number one is just, just prepare, right? Prepare the best you can, plan ahead. This is nothing new to, to all of you, I think probably listening, but we can't really understate it. Um, do your homework. Uh, and then once you do that preparation, just get out there, go try something new. Um, I think that initial step, that first step, uh, is the most challenging. So just whatever that is, whether that's reaching out to a mentor or commenting on a message board, asking a question about how to do something, um, prepare as best you can, and then just go, go try it out. Well, I want to thank you for sharing your expertise with us today, Dr. Lennington. We have a little bit more time so we can answer a few more questions from our viewers. Uh, Catherine got in touch. She says she uses a wheelchair and she wants to know if using her standing frame is a helpful way for her to exercise. Sure, that's a good question. Uh, it really depends, again, specifically kind of on, on her and her needs and her function and what the standing frame, how it's set up and how it functions. Um, I would say generally standing frames are gonna be helpful uh, for some sort of physical activity. How strenuous it is and how much it, it's really gonna benefit her depends on her particulars, but, but definitely you know, maintaining that upright posture, uh, engaging muscles, that's gonna be, it's gonna be helpful. Uh, Nadine doesn't have air conditioning, and she finds cooking in the summer makes her apartment really hot and uncomfortable. Do you have any suggestions for how Nadine can still make homemade meals but avoid heating up the entire apartment? Yeah, and that's a great question. That's one that you know you have to kind of think about. Um, again, it's all about planning. So one, if you could cook maybe a little bit earlier in the day or a little bit later in the day when it's not hot. Uh, if you do cook, maybe you could cook a few meals at a time, so you're only heating up the place once, so you do it less frequently. Uh, obviously, running a fan or air conditioning, opening doors and windows. Another thing is trying to use tools that maybe don't heat the entire um, apartment up. So you could use a toaster oven or a hot plate, something that can still help you cook, but doesn't necessarily heat up everything in your space. Oscar wrote in asking, what are hand cycles used for and how can you try one out? Great question. We touched on this just really briefly, you know, adaptive cycling. So hand cycles are basically cycles that um, typically have three wheels. And instead of having pedals that you put on with your feet, you have arm cranks. And so this would be for someone that doesn't necessarily have the functional strength in their lower extremities, like their legs um, to, to push. Uh, or they just don't have the balance and the, they want to prefer using their upper body. And so in terms of trying them, I would say, again, you know, reaching out to your, your local organizations, your groups. Obviously, if you're working with a rehabilitation professional, um, ask them. They can get you connected. For us here at the VA, we have programs where we can trial equipment. Uh, and I know there's a lot of different programs out there. Um, you know, and this this goes just a blanket statement about equipment. You know, there's so many different things out there. This kind of goes back to my takeaways that I wish I had said earlier, but you know, there's so many different types of equipment out there. And so if you try one cycle or if you try one piece of equipment, you know, and it doesn't work for you, try something else. Uh, there's all sorts of different things as far as positioning, back angles, seat height, uh, arm crank style, uh, you know, don't be deterred. If you want to be able to do something, there's probably a way for you to do it. So just keep keep trying things. Emily contacted us saying that she's struggling with the constant change in temperature going from the air conditioning in her home to a hot car. Any tips for her as she runs errands every day? Yeah, that's tough too. You know, I, I think again, planning ahead, I would probably the biggest one I would say is try to consolidate your errands so you're doing them all at once if you can. So you're not going constantly in and out, in and out, in and out, because that can stress your system. Um, you know, trying to do them all at once, doing it during you know cooler parts of the day. Again, thinking ahead, uh, when do you have the most energy? Um, obviously, you know, crack your windows in your car before you leave, that might be helpful because uh, the heat can, can really radiate um, and be a problem inside cars. Uh, those would be, I guess, that's a good question. 
you know, I think energy conservation principles still apply, you know, consolidate, plan ahead. Well, I want to thank all of you who submitted your questions and thank you, Dr. Lennington, for being with us today. Very welcome. I think that one of the best things that anyone can do for themselves, especially during these uncertain times, is to make sure that the information they're getting is credible and reliable. So we'd like to share some resources with you, and these are resources that you can count on to be current and credible. To learn more about heat and temperature sensitivity, please visit nationalmssociety.org slash heat. And for more information about recreational activities and adaptive sports, visit nationalmssociety.org slash recreation. I also want to remind you that the National MS Society's MS Navigator Team is your best partner when it comes to connecting you to the very best information and resources on living with MS. You can reach an MS Navigator by phone, email, or through the Society's website by chat. The MS Society brings people together through peer connection programs like self-help groups, the MS Friends Helpline and Paired Program, and the National MS Society Facebook community. To learn more, please visit the Society's website at nationalmssociety.org slash connections programs. Every week on the Real Talk MS podcast, I continue the conversation that we start here. So I hope you'll take a few minutes and give Real Talk MS a listen. You'll find the Real Talk MS podcast at realtalkms.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you find your favorite audio content. Don't just ride, bike MS. Bike MS is more than the ride of a lifetime. Whether you want to cross the finish line in person or take on a new challenge from anywhere, there's a Bike MS event that's right for you. Find out more and be sure to register at bikems.org. You can connect with the National MS Society along with others affected by MS on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. I encourage you to like those posts, subscribe to the channels, and make sure that you're on the Society's mailing list so you'll continue to receive the latest information on MS and updates on upcoming programs like this one. I'd like to thank Dr. Colin Lennington for joining us today. Please remember that a recording of this webinar will be available at the Society's website at nationalmssociety.org slash msexpert, as well as on Facebook and YouTube. And I hope you'll join us again for next week's edition of Ask an MS Expert. You can always find out about our upcoming program topics on the National MS Society's website. And now I have a favor to ask each of you. Getting your feedback on today's webinar is important. So you'll see a survey pop up in a moment when we close out the webinar. And if you're watching on Facebook Live, you'll see a link to that survey pinned to the comments section. And on YouTube, you'll find that link in the program description. Completing the survey makes a real difference. The information you provide helps us continuously improve and it helps shape future programs. The survey takes just one minute. So I hope you'll take a minute to fill it out. On behalf of Dr. Colin Lemington and the National MS Society, I want to thank you once again for joining us. Please stay safe and make healthy choices.